be my uh, the the components of my doctoral work um, that I completed at SFU in the Autism and Developmental Disorders Lab, and I'll be talking about uh, family quality of life and autism spectrum disorder, uh, considering both risk and resilience. So I'm going to present first just an overview of the family quality of life construct, um, as well as how this research fits within the existing literature, and. Um, this was a, a mixed method study, so I'm going to go over um, the research questions and the findings from each component and then uh, integrate it at the end, and, and as well as just talk about some of the planned um, extensions from this work. Having a child with autism spectrum disorder is often conceptualized as a risk factor for family well-being, uh, as family members' roles and relationships must be renegotiated around this significant transition, and the family family often acts as the key support network um, for the individual with ASD, in many cases well into adulthood. Uh, recent stories in the media have turned public attention towards such challenges, and I'm sure um, everyone's familiar with that uh, extremely tragic story of that mother in um, Prince Rupert who, who took her own life and her son um, with severe ASD, leaving a final note that um, highlighted these service, service gaps she had encountered. There's also, however, uh, you know, research also points to the, the great diversity that exists in families' adaptation, and many families describe their resilience in this circumstance. So this research uh, examined quality of life among families of children with ASD in British Columbia, as this construct uh, was felt to capture the variability in family functioning. Though we know that families demonstrate this range of responses uh, to raising a child with a developmental disability, research has traditionally only looked at uh, dysfunctional outcome indicators, um, such as high levels of uh, stress and uh, mental health issues like heightened anxiety or depression, uh, experiences of caregiver burden, or things like high associated uh, divorce rates. More recently, uh, family's adaptation to having a child with a disability has been considered from a more holistic and uh, multi-dimensional perspective that acknowledges positive as well as negative outcomes. Family quality of life is a, is a construct that uh, is thought to capture this more multi-dimensional perspective. So it's defined as uh, conditions where the family's needs are met and family members enjoy their life together as a family and have the chance to do things which are important to them. It's conceptualized as being representative of a continuum of family adaptation, so considering both risk and resilience, and is in contrast to uh, the research I spoke about which that focuses on outcomes of parental dysfunction and examines individual indicators like burden, stress, or, or mental health. Um, uh, so some of the core concepts associated with the family quality of life um, construct are that both subjective and objective elements are included. Um, this might refer to asking how frequently a family is able to participate in community events, for example, but also how satisfied they are with that level of participation or, or what, that le what they gain from that uh, degree of participation. It's dynamic, so we understand that it's always changing and, and ratings aren't stable over time. Both individually and family-oriented items are included. Um, this might refer to uh, aspects that pertain specifically to the individual with a disability, like uh, the kinds of disability-related support uh, an individual has, asked, has access to. But also, um, questions would ask about the impact that those kinds of services have on the broader family system. And finally, the construct is multidimensional, so it takes different domains of family life into account uh, and considers aspects that pertain to all members. And the boxes here uh, just identify the particular domains that were measured by the uh, family quality of life instrument that this research utilized. To date, much of the family quality of life research is based on studies that utilize heterogeneous samples of children with various disabilities, and most have not attempted um, to examine differences between the groups. So although this work provides extremely important insights into the role of various um, child, family, and even support characteristics, it's possible that the diverse profiles associated with the varied conditions actually uh, differentially impact family quality of life.
And this is supported by recent work uh, identifying that families of children with ASD are the least satisfied with their quality of life uh, as compared to families of typically developing children, um, as well as to families of children with other kinds of neurodevelopmental conditions like Down syndrome and ADHD. So this uh, that research underscores the considerable risk facing families of children with ASD and supports the need to explore circumstances of risk as well as the contrast, resilience within this population. The current study uh, examined quality of life among families of children and adolescents with ASD in British Columbia using a mixed methods design uh, and uh, three aims were addressed. So first the role of risk uh, factors including child behavior was examined. Second, family protective factors were examined um, using a model of family resilience that considered uh, family belief systems as well as communication and organizational patterns. And then finally, a subset of families participated in follow-up interviews, uh, providing qualitative elaboration on the variables that were examined quantitatively. So as I described, existing research suggests that families of children with ASD are at particular risk in terms of their quality of life. Uh, one risk factor may be the distinct behavioral profile characteristic of individuals with ASD uh, as these children and adolescents demonstrate behavior problems as well as impaired uh, adaptive functioning. And previous studies have identified behavior problems as a significant risk factor for family quality of life, um, yet studies have not also considered the impact of, of adaptive behavior. So adaptive functioning is defined as uh, the performance of daily activities required for personal and social sufficiency and it's measured by the extent to which an individual uh, independently executes developmentally appropriate skills across a number of domains including communication, socialization and daily living skills uh, which include personal skills like eating, uh, toileting, dressing, domestic skills like helping out around the home and then community skills like rule following and uh, understanding of money. Adaptive functioning was considered to be perhaps more impactful on the family than behavior problems as these are deficits that endure across development and a child who has difficulty you know completing those kinds of everyday tasks means that they're likely relying heavily on family members for support and this likely has significant implications for the family's quality of life. So the first aim of this study uh, was to examine how this important characteristic contributed to family quality of life while controlling for behavior problems and demographic variables that we know uh, based on previous research are very important for that for that particular outcome. So this is uh, the first study to consider both adaptive functioning and behavior problems and is the first to examine the contribution of the actual adaptive domains um, as opposed to utilizing a composite score and I'll talk about why um, that is an important approach uh, later on. So the research questions that were associated with the first aim included does child adaptive functioning predict quality of life satisfaction after controlling for behavior problems and demographic variables and then are there statistically significant differences at the quality of life uh, domain level across different levels of, of adaptive functioning. So is adaptive functioning even important once we consider behavior problems that we know are so uh, meaningful and then is it just if if it is relevant is it just at the kind of overall broader quality of life level or can we look at the uh, the impact on the components um, so as a central aspect of the quality of life perspective is the understanding that many families actually thrive despite their exposure to continued and significant challenge a second aim of this study was to examine the relations between quality of life and uh, family resilience processes. So this aspect of the research was guided by Froma Walsh's model of family resilience uh, and she defines it as the family's ability to successfully confront adverse circumstances and emerge stronger as a unit. Um, this model incorporates three broad processes including um, family belief systems that allow individuals to maintain an optimistic outlook, uh, find meaning within adversity and have strong spiritual beliefs organizational patterns that are flexible and connected, 
uh, and that include access to necessary social and economic resources. And finally, communication processes uh, characterized by clarity, open emotional expression, and collaborative uh, problem solving. So this aspect of the project uh, represents a valuable step in advancing the field as it was felt to be consistent with this more uh, multidimensional and holistic approach and it was expected that findings would yield insight into ways uh, practitioners can apply knowledge from the study of resilient families to benefit those who struggle. And the, so the associated research questions here are, are family resilience processes based on uh, the utilized model, predictive of quality of life satisfaction after controlling for these relevant variables, and then subsequently which resilience, uh, which of the processes are most meaningful, which of them are making the biggest impact. And finally, uh, a qualitative component was included. So this is consistent with uh, Shaylock, uh, who's a, a, a a critical researcher within the quality of life field with his suggestion to employ um, uh, what he terms methodological pluralism <laughs> or rich mixed methods approaches. And within this phase, families were given the opportunity to elaborate on the variables that were first examined quantitatively, thereby imp providing important and valuable context to those findings. Uh, specifically, families shared their quality of life perceptions and concerns. They reflected on how having a child with ASD had impacted their family quality of life, uh, described sources of resilience, and elaborated on their experiences with funding access and service delivery. So with regard to the latter component about uh, service delivery, Research demonstrates that perceived service adequacy is, is very important or relevant for family functioning and quality of life. Um, I'm sure you know everyone here is familiar with the BC uh, model, but the BC model of, of funding for families of children with ASD is quite unique in that all families of children aged 18 and under uh, can receive MCFD or Ministry of Children and Family Development funding um, and execute a very high degree of choice and autonomy in how they allocate those resources. Um, However, research to date has not examined families' perceptions of service access within that system. And if we look to research investigating other participant-directed uh, models or service models, uh, this research suggests that um, although uh, placing decision-making directly in the hands of families is certainly aligns with best practices of family-centered care, uh, families have mixed feelings with that approach. So some struggle with a lack of structure, perceiving uh, the breadth of choice as burdensome and overwhelming, whereas others appreciate the flexibility and the opportunity to customize their service delivery. So we're currently in the dark as to how families in BC perceive funding and service access, and this aspect of the research uh, served to shed light on their experiences. So there is a number of research questions pertaining to the qualitative uh, component, and these questions focused on families' perception. So as I mentioned, um, I was interested in actually how, how families defined quality of life and what do domains emerged as most salient um, when they described their satisfaction. And this is a way of uh, just double checking or ensuring that the tool that I utilized was actually relevant to what families are identifying as important. Um, what were their perceptions about the impact of the ASD diagnosis on the family quality of life? Did they see ASD as potentially uniquely impacting their quality of life? Uh, as I mentioned, what were their perceptions of how family quality of life is addressed within service delivery and how could this be improved? And finally, what factors do families identify as most critical in promoting family resilience? So this visual is here uh, to orient you as to how the study proceeded. So part one was the larger quantitative component in which participants completed measures over the phone and online. And then part two involved a subset of families who participated in a follow-up interview. So I'm going to uh, focus on the part one methods and results first and then transition to the qualitative component. So this slide just 
outlines the funding structure within which uh, all participating families were navigating. All received funds from the MCFD Autism Funding Ages 6 to 18 program. And so these individuals uh, are able to receive up to $6,000 a year toward eligible out of school intervention services. And participants in this component included 84 caregivers of children with ASD from across the province, though most uh, resided within Greater Vancouver. Uh, the study inclusion criteria dictated that caregivers' children with ASD be between 6 and 18 years and not have an intellectual disability. So the first uh, criterion ensured that all families received the same amount of ministry funding. And it was important that uh, participating families be navigating within the same service context as one of the study aims was to investigate their perceptions of service delivery. And regarding the second criterion, um, we felt it was important to be able to investigate child behavior without confounding the impact uh, with the impairments associated with intellectual disability. Uh, and this was important as recent research suggests that there, there are different mechanisms contributing to burden in families and those in, in, in families of children with ASD, but in those with and without intellectual impairment. So here's a summary of the family demographic information. Uh, you can see that the majority of participants were mothers and that a range of ethnicities were reported. Um, about three quarters of respondents were in married or common law relationships and 20% indicated they had multiple children with disabilities at home and the most common sibling diagnosis was also ASD. Here's a summary of the uh, child demographic information. So the male to female ratio was about six to one. And then consistent with the study inclusion criteria of children not having an intellectual disability, uh, we asked caregivers to rate their child's uh, intellectual functioning in comparison to their peers. And so you can see that these ratings were negatively skewed with high average being the most frequent rating. And then of course, uh, consistent with the disorder symptomatology, uh, their social functioning ratings were skewed in the opposite direction. So families' uh, receipt of provincial autism funds also served as a proxy for diagnostic confirmation, as one of the requirements for this program is that children are diagnosed using gold standard tools, uh, including the autism diagnostic interview and diagnostic observation schedule. Um, we also had caregivers complete the social communication questionnaire, which is a screening instrument, and about 83% of the sample met uh, the required cutoff. So this is consistent with the measure's um, original validation sample and with subsequent research examining uh, the properties of the tool. Here's a list of the questionnaires that they completed. Uh, caregivers completed the measure of adaptive functioning, the Vineland, over the phone, and then the remaining instruments were uh, completed online using a SFU web survey tool. And I'll just note that 10 participants um, preferred to complete paper versions of the online measures, but this was not found to uh, differentially influence their responses. So in order to address the first research question, it was important to consider whether it was more appropriate to utilize a composite score that averages across the adaptive domains or to examine each domain. So this chart uh, presents a profile of, or presents the profile of children's adaptive functioning uh, within the sample. And as you can see, when you look at the domains on the, um, my left, it's quite, it's quite uneven with socialization skills emerging as a particular area of deficit. So this is of course consistent with the, with the disorder. Um, however, there was concern that the composite score noted with ABC and the blue uh, bar would not sufficiently capture this variability. So analyses were first conducted using the composite score. And you can see in the correlation table that family income, behavior problems, and adaptive functioning uh, demonstrated statistically significant associations with family quality of life. Um, when a hierarchical uh, regression analysis was then conducted, uh, I included child gender, age, parents, 
rating of their child's disability severity, and then family income in step one. And inclusion of these variables was guided by previous research. Uh, behavior problems was entered in step two, and then adaptive functioning as measured by the composite score in step three. So in the final model, uh, behavior problems was the only predictor to make a significant contribution. Uh, family income approach significance and adaptive functioning did not make a significant contribution above and beyond the other predictors. Uh, in fact, inclusion of adaptive functioning explained only an, an additional 2% of the variance in quality of life satisfaction above and beyond model two. So this isn't statistically or particularly clinically uh, significant. So as such, uh, I then turned to examine the contribution of each adaptive domain because I was wondering if we might be losing some of the meaningful variability with that composite score. So in this correlation analysis, um, you can see that new significant relations emerged between quality of life and the daily living skills and socialization adaptive domains. And then in the next regression analysis, with the three adaptive domains included in step three, uh, in the final model, family income and behavior problems, again, made significant contributions. And in terms of adaptive functioning, uh, daily living skills emerged as significant. And inclusion of the three adaptive domains actually accounted for an additional 12% of the variance in quality of life satisfaction, with daily living skills alone accounting for 10.5% uh, of this above and beyond the other variables. So this tells us that this is obviously a very meaningful aspect of functioning to consider. Um, there's also previous research that suggests that behavior problems uh, may change across different adaptive levels and may increase with age, and that adaptive functioning deficits may worsen with age. Um, so because uh, you know, we're aware of this, and I, I was interested in how these kinds of risk factors might, might interact, uh, the impact of these interactions on quality of life were investigated. So the three sets uh, listed there of interaction terms were included one at a time in the model. However, none of those uh, interaction terms resulted in a statistically significant increase in quality of life uh, variance. So they were removed and just the main effects uh, were interpreted. Uh, in order to address the next research question about the impact of adaptive functioning on the quality of life domains, uh, a MANOVA was conducted with daily living skill level, so low, uh, moderately low or adequate, entered as a fixed factor, and then satisfaction with each quality of life domain as, as the dependent variables. Um, these analyses revealed a number of significant differences and the asterisks indicate statistical significance between the respective groups as compared to the adequate group. So you can see uh, that there was a significant of effect of adaptive level on every quality of life domain such that families of children uh, whose daily living skills were in the adequate range had significantly higher quality of life satisfaction as compared to those whose children functioned in the low or moderately low ranges. Um, so I'm gonna shift now to talking about the uh, family resilience aspect of the study. Um, so in terms of the relations between the examined family resilience processes and quality of life, all of the processes were significantly related to quality of life with the exception of family spirituality. Um, when a regression was conducted with the same dem demographic variables accounted for in step one and then the six processes in step two, uh, the second model was statistically significant and accounted for an additional 47% uh, of the variance in quality of life satisfaction. And then uh, when I looked at the individual process to, processes to see which were, were the most meaningful or playing the largest role in quality of life. It was family communication and problem solving and family connectedness um, that emerged as most significant. And interestingly, if we take uh, the risk factors that emerged from um, the adaptive functioning and behavior problems uh, component that I talked about and include them in this, it's still uh, communication and problem solving and connectedness that explain significant variance above and beyond those very powerful circumstances of risk. 
so that wraps up the part one methods and results. So I'm going to shift um, to talking about the qualitative component now. So on the quality of life survey that, that caregivers completed online, um, we elected to include an additional item that we called global family quality of life. And this item asked overall, how satisfied are you with your family's quality of life? So the purpose of including this item um, was there was a, a couple of purposes. One was so that we could select interview participants um, such that both high and low ends of the quality of life continuum were represented. Um, so potential interview participants were first approached based on their ratings to that question. Uh, we felt this might be a more um, a better way to, to access this, this range in the continuum than simply looking at an average across their item ratings on the overall scale. So after participants agreed, uh, their caregiving partners, if they were in such a relationship, were also invited to participate. However, only three uh, actually agreed and all were from the high quality of life group. So in total, uh, 15 individuals participated in the follow-up interview, representing 12 families, including six high and six low. Uh, and interestingly, low quality of life families reported lower family income, uh, lower child adaptive functioning, higher child behavior problems, and lower endorsement of the resilience processes. Um, interviews were approximately uh, an hour to an hour and a half long and were conducted in person over the telephone or via Skype uh, and covered a range of topics, which I'll elaborate on as I review the themes. Um, although specific topics were included within the interview guide, the semi-structured nature of the interview allowed for new themes to emerge. The qualitative component of the research uh, was guided by a modified grounded theory approach in which interview, uh, an interview guide was developed a priori. However, as noted, the approach was open to new themes. So uh, in terms of the analysis, uh, first broad brush coding took place in which statements were grouped according to major categories that emerged uh, time and time again, such as service delivery, experiences with school, uh, and ASD diagnosis, for example. Um, and then within each of those categories, more inductive, open, and axial coding took place in which indicators were made for statements, and then these were brought together into concepts and eventually into overarching themes. And all of the qualitative data analysis was conducted using a program called in vivo. So this uh, slide is here just to show an example of what the coding process looked like. Um, this is uh, with regard to the ASD diagnosis category. So uh, family, so indicators were made for family statements. So for example, um, some talked about how the diagnosis uh, brought their family together and allowed them to be more open in their communication, not walk on eggshells anymore, for example. And these were grouped into the concept of actually easing family relations uh, and easing interactions and, and classified under the theme of, of benefits. And then contrasted with um, those who spoke about things like feeling isolated or uh, undergoing a, a, an extensive period of grief or denial. So trustworthiness uh, is a method of ensuring rigor in qualitative designs. And um, this was achieved by meeting four criteria. So six techniques were used to address credibility, including prolonged engagement in the field, uh, triangulation across methods and participants, uh, member checking of transcripts, themes, and results, peer debriefing, searching for discrepant evidence, and reporting quasi-statistics. Uh, transferability was met with thick description of the study context, participants, and themes. Uh, dependability strategies included keeping a detailed audit trail, uh, including raw data, coding iterations, and dated memos. And an independent coder also analyzed a portion of the data, and inter-rater reliability was acceptable. And finally, uh, confirmability was addressed using a number of the already identified strategies. 
So families, uh, within the interviews, families were first asked to reflect on what family quality of life meant to them. Uh, these discussions were quite general and most of the themes were elaborated on quite substantially uh, within the next section when they talked about their, their satisfaction. So I've chosen to just highlight the fluidity theme here as this was the only place that this particular theme arose. Um, participants within this theme, Participants reflected that their family quality of life is not static, but always changing and actually different for everyone. Uh, they distinguished between short and long-term quality of life, which included uncertainties of how family life could change in the future and how that would impact their quality of life at that point in time. Uh, so this quote demonstrates the themes that came up from this question, including those related to the nature of the family environment, um, <clears throat> their emotional and physical well-being, as well as the situational nature of this construct. So this was a father who says, uh, quality of life isn't the how much you make or what vacation you get to go on. Quality of life is the day-to-day -day living environment of supporting a kid with ASD. And part of that is there's an emotional and physical toll on everybody in the family. And we've talked to some families where it's far worse. I think it's very situational, child by child and family by family. So in my mind, the quality of life is sort of the measurement of the household where there's, where there's an ASD child and how they cope with it. If it's nonstop yelling and frustration, that's one quality of life. And if it's all roses and flowers, that's sort of another quality of life. <laughs> Uh, caregivers were then reminded of how they rated their overall quality of life on that global uh, item on the survey and asked to elaborate on why they chose those ratings. So six themes emerged from these discussions. Uh, with, <clears throat> within support, caregivers described aspects of both formal and informal support. And the majority of the discussions focused on how insufficient support uh, negatively impacted their family quality of life. So high quality of life caregivers shared both their dissatisfaction and satisfaction with formal service, uh, whereas low caregivers talked more about dissatisfaction. They also talked uh, about being isolated by a lack of social support, whereas this did not emerge for those classified as high in quality of life. Within individual characteristics, uh, participants described how individual family members' attributes contributed to the overall satisfaction of the family. Um, they focused on positive caregiver qualities like resourcefulness and high uh, motivation, as well as child strengths such as persevering through challenges uh, and child challenges like inflexibility or high anxiety and uh, lacking emotional expressivity. Whereas those classified as high spoke quite evenly about challenges and strengths, uh, low caregivers focused more on child difficulties. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly, caregivers often made comparisons to other families. So they considered how poor levels of child functioning, for example, uh, parenting capacity like spousal disagreement or service capacity, such as having lex less access to support, uh, could negatively affect their quality of life. And when, when I compared themes across the high and low uh, participants. High participants talked more about having cohesive marriages shared by, uh, characterized by a shared positivity and approach to parenting and discipline, whereas low caregivers spoke most about how having a lower functioning child would present even additional challenges to their family. Uh, participants described family interactions, both harmonious, such as uh, marital cohesion, and discordant, such as friction among spouses and within parent-child relationships. Uh, high quality of life caregivers discussed family harmony, whereas low quality of life participants spoke more about negative interactions. Uh, within personal fulfillment, Caregivers spoke about sacrificing uh, their physical and emotional health as well as personal aspirations in order to devote their energy to their children. Uh, high quality of life caregivers spoke generally about the constant presence of challenges but also noted that these difficulties were outweighed by their many family strengths. Um, in contrast, low quality of life individuals spoke more about the constant stresses of parenting and the many personal sacrifices they had to make. 
Uh, material security focused uh, on, on financial capacity, uh, with those identified as high in quality of life, talking about feeling financially secure, and those classified as low, focusing on financial strain. And what was interesting about this is not all, they did as I noted, report higher family income. But what was interesting was there was the high quality of life participants' perceptions of security. So one family spoke about being a low income family, but they felt secure in that they knew where they were going to live. Their husband uh, w was actually on disability at the time, but they felt secure in knowing where those payments were going to come from. So although they might be classified as low income, their perception of that situation was secure. Uh, so the first quote here is from a low quality of life mother who describes the lack of cohesion and support with her spouse regarding uh, child treatment. So she says, my husband, he always criticized what I tried to do with uh, our son's program because if he didn't act the way he wanted him to, it's obviously my fault because I didn't get the right programs in place for him. Not on a different page. My husband's not on any page. He had no input on anything. He couldn't have cared less. Uh, the second one is from a high quality of life mother who shares how uh, although her and her husband had very different ideas regarding treatment, they were able to come together and find a method that incorporated both of their viewpoints. So she says, uh, we're drawn to different things, but we would oftentimes, oftentimes use each other's. We'd use adjunct therapies. Between the two of us, we centralized. I think we were both open to trying different things. When participants reflected on how receiving the diagnosis uh, had impacted their quality of life, two themes emerged. So within benefits, caregivers focused on the new access to support that accompanied the designation, uh, as well as the sense of validation and relief that they experienced. They communicated that this helped to ease family relations. So uh, one mom said, now we're more open. Uh, it made everyone feel okay to be themselves. And those who reflected on detriments spoke about the difficult path to diagnosis. So they talked about uh, long wait times or, or how their children were actually initially misdiagnosed. Other family members' negative emotional responses like grief or denial and their per perceptions of having very little guidance during this period of significant transition. Uh, one mother said, it didn't alleviate any kind of issues that I had not related to my son. There was no holistic view. Participants in the high quality of life and low quality of life groups focused equally on benefits and detriments. And only high quality of life participants spoke about the, the lack of guidance they received uh, after their child was diagnosed, identifying that this was an opportunity that they would uh, like further intervention. When participants reflected on whether they thought of ASD as uniquely impacting quality of life, uh, two themes emerged. So most participants considered ASD as unique in terms of the impact on quality of life. Uh, this was due to perceptions that it exerted greater stress on the family, but afforded unique access to services and supports uh, that families of children with other kinds of disabilities were unable to utilize. Families also talked about uh, perceptions that this is an invisible disability and the negative uh, social judgments they encountered in overcoming the, those uh, perceptions. So one mother said, as a society, I think in general, we're a lot more tolerant of visible, visible disabilities than invisible. It's very hard for people to wrap their heads around. And she actually compares uh, ASD to a, a mental health condition. Relatively fewer spoke about uh, commonalities, and those who did focused on how some children uh, with other kinds of physical or neurological disabilities would exhibit similar adaptive functioning limitations to those with ASD and would continue to rely uh, on their parents for support. So this is a father who said, uh, similar to other disabilities, these parents have little satisfaction in knowing that their children will grow up to be able to function independently and have themselves a degree of quality of life. Participants in the high and low groups demonstrated similar patterns of discussion, uh, with most suggesting that quality of life was uniquely impacted by having a child with ASD. Uh, more of those classified as high 
uh, reflected on the unique service access that this particular diagnosis afforded. When participants were asked how well quality of life was addressed within service delivery, um, they distinguished between community-based and school-based services. So within community-based services, they reflected on three themes. Um, they shared perceptions regarding the autism funding, as well as perceived service strengths and gaps. Uh, with regard to the funding, Almost all caregivers acknowledged how much they appreciated the funds. However, they indicated that the provided amount was insufficient to access their desired level of support. Uh, they also described the funding system as inefficient, inflexible, and inconsistent in terms of the kinds of therapies that might be funded for different families. Participants also shared positive experiences in which they felt that the broader needs of the family were considered in addition to those uh, of specific to the child. And they emphasized the, the practices of information sharing and partnering. Um, and it was high quality of life participants who were more likely to elaborate with specific examples of these positive practices. All participants felt that quality of life was often not uh, family quality of life was often not appropriately addressed within service uh, and identified glaring gaps such as the prevailing lack of guidance. Um, they described difficulty finding appropriate service and feeling very alone in this navigation. They also shared concerns about post-19 support uh, once the MCFD funding had stopped. The only difference here across the high and low groups uh, pertain to participants' descriptions of the service system as reactive in approach, uh, as this came up for more low quality of life participants who spoke about having to reach crisis before they felt uh, their needs were, were addressed or even acknowledged. So the first quote here is about how limited funds prevent families from accessing the, service they, the services they see as priorities for their child. Uh, so this mom says, the funding is not even close to enough. So then you're in a position where you have to choose major priorities. Out of all of these things that my kid really needs, what does he need most desperately? And that sucks. Uh, the last two reflect the lack of guidance uh, that, that families shared that, uh, within the service system. In the middle one, the father is speaking about feeling alone and finding out about different service options. So he says, it's the wild, wild west, everyone for themselves. There is no specialist out there that you can go to who will help you. You have to explore what, which works out for you. And the last one, the mother, the mother shares her perceptions uh, of the lack of available assistance in helping families to actually initiate service. So she says, uh, you get thrown this money, which is great, but what do you do with that? You're turning left or right, you just don't know. There's nobody to walk you through it. As related to school-based services, uh, scare, caregivers spoke about resources and partnering. Um, all spoke about school-based resources and reflected on their overwhelming scarcity. They, shared, they also shared concerns about the perceived uh, lack of transparency around resource availability and allocation. Uh, this father said, I don't know what exists. I have no idea. I have to accept what's there, put up with it, or otherwise take your child elsewhere. High and low participants demonstrated the same distribution of discussion content as they focused more on um, the perceived unavailability of resources and less on their confusion of how they were allocated. Uh, participants who spoke about the importance of family school partnerships reflected on positive experiences when this was exemplified across various levels of school personnel. Uh, so there, um, one, uh, these parents talked about um, having partnership demonstrated at the level of the administrator down to the teachers and to the classroom aides. And one mother said, uh, it starts at the administration. The administration sets the tone and the teaching staff take that tone. It's hard to find someone that's that dedicated. Partnering was more salient for the high quality of life participants, uh, as all shared how their school was open to partnering, specifically represent, uh, referencing administrators, teachers, and aides, whereas no one within the low quality of life group uh, reflected on that aspect. 
And finally, uh, when families were asked whether they thought of their family as resilient in the face of adverse circumstances, most indicated that they did. Um, they described sources of resilience, including their optimistic outlooks, uh, ability to adapt to changing circumstances, and positive communication uh, patterns within their family. They also spoke about relying on social support uh, from uh, extended family members and, and friend networks. Uh, they also identified desired services that they felt would help them to be more resilient, uh, citing that respite, family counseling, and further education and networking opportunities would be helpful. Only high quality of life participants elaborated on ways that their resiliency had been tested and shared specific examples of overcoming those challenges. So low quality of life interviewees spoke almost equally about the topics, including family strengths and personal characteristics, but were less likely to recount uh, specific examples of when they had been uh, tested. And so when I asked families what they thought of uh, what came to mind when, when I said family resilience and did they think of their family in this way? A father said, to him, resiliency meant there is no pause, there is no break. There are good days and bad days, but you don't have a choice but to keep going. We can't say, well, you're not going to have ASD this year, so it becomes the new normal. Uh, in examining quality of life among families of children and adolescents with ASD, the role of risk, including behavior, and protective factors, including resilience processes, were examined, and families were asked to share their perceptions on a number of topics. Uh, this study examined the role of particular risk factors in quality of life satisfaction. Uh, overall, family income, behavior problems, and daily living skills emerged as significant predictors in the model explaining quality of life satisfaction. Uh, with regard to family income, this has consistently emerged as an important characteristic in predicting quality of life, and it emerged as significant in this research in all analyses. The findings highlight the continued relevance of family income, even when these meaningful uh, adaptive and behavioral care, uh, profiles are considered. This characteristic may be particularly relevant to the ASD population, uh, as previous research has demonstrated the greater financial impact resulting from the child's condition experienced by families of children with ASD, as compared to uh, ADHD, for example. And in this study, family income also accounted for greater variance than has been previously reported uh, in research including families of children with varied conditions. This also aligns with, with uh, many of the qualitative themes that emerged around funding strain, or excuse me, financial strain and funding concerns. Uh, also consistent with previous research, behavior problems emerged as significant. Uh, previous research indicates that the role of behavior problems in quality of life may be related to the perceived intensity of these difficulties, as well as families' associated feelings of uh, uncertainty with regard to uh, behavior management. With regard to adaptive functioning, uh, this variable did not emerge as significant when measured with the composite score. However, when the three adaptive domains were included in the model, significant additional variance was accounted for, and daily living skills emerged as an important predictor above and beyond the other examined variables. Um, <clears throat> the findings indicate that it's not the most pronounced socialization deficit that exerts the greatest impact on family quality of life but is instead the demonstrated difficulties with day-to-day -day personal, domestic, and community skills. Uh, it's, it's possible that uh, communication and socialization skills may require less tangible assistance from family members and, and may be less impactful in terms of how the rest of the family functions. These kinds of skills are also more frequently targeted within intervention, and family may feel less responsibility to ameliorate these kinds of challenges as they're addressed outside of the home. Uh, there were also significant differences across each quality of life domain when groups were separated by daily living skill level, underscoring the importance of developing these adaptive capacities for multiple areas of family life. 
Uh, this uh, aspect of the research has important implications for both clinical practice and research. Uh, with regard to intervention, daily living skills are not as frequently targeted uh, within, within intervention for those without intellectual impairment, yet the findings demonstrate their relevance to this uh, higher functioning group. The findings highlight the importance of explicitly targeting children's day-to-day -day difficulties as improving these skills may alleviate some of the, some of the family demands. Uh, and so when examined by domain for the second research question, daily living skills exerted the largest effect on the parenting quality of life domain, which focuses on guidance, discipline, and teaching. Uh, so it's expected that easing those kinds of responsibilities will exert cascading and positive effects on other domains, uh, perhaps resulting in more enjoyable family interactions, reduced stress and improved emotional well-being, and better fulfilled support needs. The findings also indicate uh, that future research should examine adaptive functioning by domain when investigating the impact on family outcomes. Uh, a composite measure in which a standard score is assigned based on the sum across the domains may not be a, may not be a meaningful or appropriate indicator for this population as it fails to sufficiently capture the cross-domain functional discrepancies uh, common to this population. It may, however, be appropriate for other neurodevelopmental disorders, um, such as for those with intellectual disability who demonstrate a more uh, even pattern of adaptive deficit. In examining family resilience, uh, six processes across the three categories were examined. All processes, with the exception of spirituality, were significantly correlated with quality of life and two contributed significantly to the model explaining satisfaction. Uh, these findings are very consistent with previous research, as well as with the qualitative themes that emerged. As excuse me, family members spoke a lot about their optimism and adaptation to difficulty, uh, reliance on immediate and extended family, as well as about uh, communicating openly and positively. This component of the study represents a valuable contribution to quality of life research as it extends upon the identification of risk and sheds light on families who demonstrate successful adaptation despite facing considerable adversity. The findings also highlight ways in which professionals can support such families uh, as they demonstrate the importance of fostering families' positive communication patterns and op open emotional expression. And when comparing qualitative themes across groups, uh, it was apparent that those representing the low quality of life perspective focused more on difficulties and challenges, whereas high quality of life participants uh, presented more balanced perspectives. They certainly identified challenges, but they also identified strengths. Low quality of life families, in contrast, uh, focused on child challenges, social isolation, and financial strain. Overall, participants' percep perceptions of service delivery emerged as a particular area of concern, and one of the most frequently identified issues uh, was the prevailing lack of guidance to help families navigate through the complicated funding system and to choose among the many intervention options. They perceived a lack of transparency regarding service availability, how a particular service might fit with their family's needs, and regarding its quality. Uh, overall, they perceived a mismatch between the funding system that promulgates family choice and autonomy and their experiences actually navigating within that system. They shared how burdensome they found uh, funding and service coordination to be and suggested that insufficient guidance left them feeling emotionally and financially strained and concerned that their children's developmental progress was being hampered. Uh, this suggests that funding services for children with ASD is necessary, though not sufficient, to address the needs of these families. The findings also suggest uh, that there is significant opportunity for policy revision in this regard. Unfortunately, these kinds of themes are not new and are present within work that is more than a decade old, uh, indicating that practice is lagging behind theory in this regard. Uh, and addressing the perceived limitations with greater flexibility, as well as pairing families with a knowledgeable na navigator may ameliorate some of these identified challenges. 
Uh, so I'll note uh, a few limitations of the study. Uh, the utilized online and phone methodology precluded verification of children's intellectual functioning level. However, the observed adaptive profile is very consistent with research on individuals with ASD of a similar age range and who have an IQ above 70. Uh, moreover, conducting the study in this way obviously uh, facilitated reaching a very uh, wide and dispersed participant group that would have likely been impossible if participants were actually required to come into the lab. Um, another limitation relates to the fact that the majority of participants were mothers. Uh, this is a consistent issue in, in research examining uh, parental and family outcomes and is also likely reflective of the distribution of family responsibility. Uh, but it speaks to the issue of having one individual speak on behalf of the collective family unit. So uh, as I described, efforts were made to include caregiving partners in the interviews, however, very few uh, actually took me up on it. So future research should continue to seek to include a range of individuals um, from both the ex immediate and extended family networks. The data are also limited by the fact that all surveys were available only in English. Um, although a range of ethnicities and primary and secondary languages were reported, families who were not comfortable with English were, were excluded from participating. Uh, this might be a particularly at risk and isolated group of families, and it's important that future research makes special effort to seek out and involve these individuals, uh, as they may require very specific supports. And finally, this research provides only a snapshot into family quality of life at one point in time. Future research that can adopt a family life cycle perspective and that follows a family long longitudinally will add a critical uh, temporal layer to our understanding of the identified processes. Um, so in conclusion, this study revealed important insights into circumstances of risk and resilience for quality of life among families of children and adolescents with ASD in British Columbia and has significant implications for policy, uh, clinical practice, and future research. And I'll just highlight uh, some of the directions that we're uh, planning on going with this. Uh, so the first aspect, uh, I found it very interesting that it was the daily living skills component that emerged as so significant, particularly in this higher functioning um, group of kids. So what, what I'm actually working on in my postdoctoral research is looking at that aspect of adaptive functioning within other uh, populations of, of neurodevelopmental disabilities. Um, I expect that that you know, given daily living skills was so relevant for ASD, it's likely the case for other populations, and uh, it's possible that you know identifying the kinds of supports that can address these and help families will benefit families, you know, beyond just the ASD uh, group, uh, more um, uh, broad-reaching intervention implications. I'm also interested in examining the, inter the interrelation between the risk and protective factors. So uh, I mentioned that a little bit, that aspect of the research is, was not included within the actual dissertation and I'm starting to look at that now. Um, but I, that's gonna, going to you know, give us a more informed understanding about these families who are facing these obviously very meaningful and significant challenges, how they implement those processes that were identified as so relevant of connectedness and communication, how they actually execute those processes within the family uh, to perceive themselves as, as resilient. And finally, um, the, so the research that I presented on here was, on, was actually on a subset of families uh, who participated. So the inclusion criteria for my dissertation was that families, that ch uh, children of families were between 6 and 18 and not have an intellectual disability, but we actually didn't turn families away. So we have a much broader sample of about uh, double, it's, uh, it's 161 families right now. Um, of children of a very broad age range. So right now I think it's age two to 35. So these individuals are navigating all the different possible kind of service contexts that we have here in BC. And one thing that I'm 
in the midst of right now is actually comparing how quality of life changes across the different service delivery context, as well as how their perceptions of service delivery change and their ratings of satisfaction uh, with service access change across the different um, models. So i just like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the many families who donated their very precious time to participate in this research, uh, my research assistant and volunteers, the funding so sources that supported my doctoral work, as well as those that will support my postdoctoral research and my supervisory committee. So thank you very much.